Hi, everyone. It's Kathleen Rose, and this is the Presidential Podcast. So this is part two of our two-part Women's History Month podcast. And if you have been listening, hopefully you've had the opportunity to enjoy the first podcast uh, of this series where I interviewed Sydney LaRose and Nancy Bailey, two shining stars here on the Gavilan campus, and talked a little bit about uh, their their uh, work on the college, uh, at the college, and their years of service, and how they feel about the idea of balance is better, the international women's theme going forward. And today, we're going to have the opportunity to hear from Jillian Wilson and Nikki DeQuinn, two additional stars on the Gavilan campus. Before we get started, um, I was sharing the last time a little information from the International Women's Day Lean In data on women in the workplace. And I wanted to share a couple more uh, data facts for you about how women are faring globally in their work across the planet. And so I found it very interesting in the field of education throughout the world 77% of the positions that are filled in teaching positions are women, but only 23% of women are superintendents in leadership positions in education. In the field of agriculture, 31% of women are farmers in the world, and only 14% of women are ones who are in charge of farms, are principal operators of farms. In restaurants, in the restaurant field, 60% of women are are women, are the ones who are the food prep workers in restaurants. And only 19% of women are those who are chefs in restaurants. Overall, women are paid in most arenas 20% less than men in the U.S. And globally, women are paid 23% less. At this rate, it will take more than 202 years to close the gender pay gap globally. In the U.S., nearly two-thirds of the minimum wage workers are women, and nearly one in eight women live in poverty in the U.S. And so all of this is set against a backdrop of global inequality, and that's something that we have a lot of conversations about here at the Gavilan campus. And so during this month of women's history, I hope that we continue to talk about that under the backdrop of our principles of community, inclusion, equity, purpose, and equality, to really talk about how we can raise the bar in our equity opportunities here at the college and look at some of these startling statistics on how women are working across our globe and beyond. So when we come back, we're going to have our our interview with Nikki and Jillian, and then I'll wrap up with some other inspiring women that I would like you to know about. We'll be back in a moment. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Presidential Podcast. And I'm Kathleen, of course, and I am here with two fantastic women at Gavilan College. I'm with Jillian Wilson, who works, as you know, in the library and is also our classified professional support staff president extraordinaire this year. And I'm also with Nikki DeQuinn, Nikki DeQuinn, full-time faculty, kinesiology, and also the president of our academic senate. So welcome, ladies, to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So, you know, it's Women's History Month, and this is the second uh, installment of my podcast for the month, and I wanted to select women on campus who inspire me. Women on campus who, whenever I see them on campus, I know I'm going to get a dose of joy. I'm going to get a dose of leadership inspiration. I'm going to get a little bit 
of reality check, and I'm also going to get an opportunity for just to check in, and you two are definitely it. So, um, Jillian, how long have you worked at Gavlin? And tell our listeners a little bit about what you do. Okay, um, I've worked here for five years in November, so a little over five years now. I work in the library. Um, I do my technical job is like cataloging the books, um, purchase orders, basically like office management type stuff, but with a library emphasis. And so, but you started here with your undergraduate degree, and since you've been at Gavilan, you've you've sort of taken on more education in your life. Yes, I completed my master's degree in library and information science. Um, my specialty is not cataloging, though. Yeah. It, <laughs> it is children's services, mm -hmm. and um, I also have a academic certificate in um, youth and young adult services. Okay, terrific. We'll come back to that in okay. a little bit. <laughs> so, Nikki, how about you? I think you were born at Gavilan College, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just about. Um, I, I think I'm in my 14th year, although wow. I actually spent a year here, and I believe it was 2000, right out of college as an assistant softball coach. So, total about 15 years here. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So... Tell, tell us what you've done during those 14 years, because your role has changed a little bit. Yes, I've worn quite a few hats. So when I first came to Gavilan, I was an assistant softball coach. Uh, when I returned to Gavilan, I believe it was about 14 years ago, I came back as the head softball coach, and I mm -hmm. was the head softball coach for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Susan Dodd retired, I also took on the role of the department chair for kinesiology and athletics. Um, it, things got very busy and I decided to step away from softball two years ago and immediately went into the academic Senate presidency. So now my hats are academic Senate president and chair of the kinesiology and athletic department, along with teaching. I love my students. <laughs> so you both decided to jump into leadership positions at the college. Can you talk a little bit about why you made that leap, why you made that choice? Um, well, I've always been involved in leadership from a very young age. My parents were um, heavily involved in politics. And so as an eight-year-old, I was doing things like campaigning for the sheriff of Nevada and the governor and going to very grown-up fundraising dinners and talking to people who had been in prison camps in the Bay of Pigs, <laughs> things like that. Wow. I not, did not have a very... Cool normal childhood, but it was very interesting. <laughs> um, and so I've always been um, oriented towards leadership roles. Um, and I just saw a need um, in CSEA to, to just kind of give our members a boost in morale, to think of themselves as leaders as well, and to kind of restructure some things so that we would be more involved in shared governance. And how about for you, Nikki? Um, I think I fell into leadership. <laughs> um, I, I Prior to becoming Academic Senate President, I was um, co-president of our Coaches Association for many years for, for softball. And um, when I decided that it was time to, to get out of softball, Dr. Rose, you actually approached me and asked what I thought about um, being part of the Academic Senate. And I hadn't really thought about it, but the more I did think um, about the changes that were coming, I thought I could be helpful. I thought I could be useful. I thought I could help navigate that change. Um, and so, you know, my peers voted me in and I'm I'm learning. Um, there's, as you know, a lot of change happening. And I think we've done some really good things to to help um, transform the relationships across campus. And so mm -hmm. that's that's why I agreed to do it. And I agreed to run again um, for a second <laughs> term. <Yeah. laughs> yes, I'm very Help excited Help navigate about this, that. these changes. And we certainly saw that last week when the accreditation team was here. One of the things the team chair, Mike Clare, said to me was how impressed he was with how leadership steps up. 
here across the board. And it was not forced. It felt authentic and genuine. And he could see that that was a part of the culture at the college. And I have both of you to thank for that. So I appreciate that so much. Thank you. So tell me about what major changes you have experienced for women in the workplace while while at Gavlin. What do you observe about that here? I don't I don't know that I've noticed significant change, but it's interesting how many women we have in significant leadership positions. So you look yeah. at the board, it's I think more than half mm-hmm. female. Right. Yep. Um, our administrative offices are mostly female, including mm-hmm. our president and both mm-hmm. of our VPs. Um, and when you look too at leadership at the you know, more in the middle areas, um, I just see a lot of women in those roles and encouraging mm-hmm. each other to be in those roles. And it's funny when I go to like um, chapter president, I was just at a chapter president training um, last Saturday, and of all the chapter presidents in the area, only two were men. So I think, huh. you know, on right. on those maybe um, more mid-level areas of leadership, women really do fill the seats. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you think, Nick? Um, well, I I I have seen quite a bit of change or noticed the change. Um, Dr. Rose, you're the first female president that the college has had, correct? Second. Second. Yeah, oh, Rose I'm sorry. Joyce oh, that's right. How could I forget yeah. her? Oh my yeah. gosh, yeah. that's terrible. Yeah. So you're the second female mm-hmm. president um, in, in our department. My, you know, doc, um, Susan Dodd. Mm-hmm was our department chair and a leader in our department for many, many years. She was the first female um, in our department. And then um, now I'm only the second female in that department Mm -hmm. um, to take on the the, the department chair role. Um, And those are some big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I think that it's a positive thing. Part of why I got into coaching when I was so young was because I felt that females needed to see somebody like them, a female role model. Um, You know, we talk about equity a lot these days, and and you can't be who you can't see, or it's very difficult. And so that's why I got into what I I had got into in the profession that I got into. Um, And so now, you know, seeing women in leadership roles is very inspiring. It's very empowering. It's it's extremely important for the young people in our, you know, for young people in general to see strong women. Mm-hmm. So, absolutely. Yeah, seen a lot absolutely. of change. So, what opportunities do you think there are for growth for young women as they come through the community college system? Do you think this is a good era for those who are attending the community college now, particularly for women? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I do. I think just in general, um, this is a good time for women. We have more women enrolled in colleges and universities in general than men. I don't. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily saying that's like a great thing for men. You know, I mean, I, I, I think I don't want to hurt men either. But I think it's good. It's it's time for women to be more in the workforce, to be more in leadership roles. Um, and I would just encourage women to look into fields where, um, for whatever reason, women sort of get discouraged early on, right. like in STEM, right. yeah. engineering. Um, my husband works at a music um, company where they make recording equipment, and their equipment mimics analog mm-hmm. sound in mm-hmm. a digital environment. Mm-hmm. And they just they don't have a lot of women in the software or hardware engineering departments. Mm-hmm. They're, all the women are in basically marketing or mm-hmm. HR or departments like that. And, and he keeps telling me, well, we don't have enough women coming in the pipeline who have both music sk- skills and engineering skills. Mm-hmm. And those are two fields where women do get discouraged early. Mm-hmm. And I keep telling him, then you guys need to do something about the pipeline. Right. <laughs> you need to encourage yeah. younger, you need to do support programs that are encouraging girls to stay mm-hmm. in coding or things like of that nature. So. All right. It's funny you say that. I was just talking to Ken Wagman the other day and telling him how much my daughter, who's only seven, loves math. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And we know that young women, you know, they start off really enjoying things like that, but Absolutely. then somehow down, as you're saying, mm-hmm. down the line, they start to fall off. So I'm at, I'm wanting to know how I continue, can continue to foster her love for math. She loves music too, by the mm-hmm. way. Good. But how to continue <laughs> to foster that through her, you know, as she's growing up and then through her teen years and, and beyond. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Those are great, great ideas. So who have been, who are some of the women who have been the most influential in your life and why? Well, I know this is kind of a trite answer, but my mother mm-hmm. <laughs> is a really important yeah. figure in my life. Um, I mentioned before that my parents were in politics when I was growing up. Um, and my mom, my dad was the campaign manager and my mom would do the fundraising events and it it's kind of incredible to see how she works a room to raise money <laughs> and to just schmooze with people. I mean, it's it's Is she available for hire, by the way? <laughs> She's retired. <laughs> she is? Perfect. Oh, that's okay. That's perfect. <laughs> I'll mention it to her. Um, yeah, no, she, she did incredible things. And, um, you know, my parent, both of my parents actually, my dad used to introduce me to people as the the – future female president of the United States or something like that. Uh, (laughs) I have no political aspirations of that nature, Mm -hmm. but it was very like, that made me feel very empowered Mm -hmm. and um, very much like encouraging me to be my own person. Yeah. So my parents for sure. Um, I'm I'm the same. My mom, you know, my parents were, you know, middle-class people. My mom worked. She carted all three of us to all of our games along with my dad. She, they volunteered, you know, they, and I think that's a, where I get my sense of wanting to give back to the community. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if, you know, my parents were out volunteering last month for the, um, mobile food pantry that we were do. They? Yeah. Yeah. Campus? They were here oh. on campus. My daughter was on break and they brought her out and oh, I had that's great. all three of them out there, which was really cool. But, uh, you know, I, I got that from them and mm-hmm. I've, I've also had some really good, um, male role models in my life that have mm-hmm. encouraged me or saw things in me. And so I was very, I'm very grateful for that. Some of who, you know, continue to work here or, or were, you know, former employees here. Um, in my career, I've had some, some really outstanding female coaches. Um, Mm -hmm. most of them, the majority of them were males growing Mm -hmm. up. And so having the two female coaches that I did, you know, I learned a lot of what I would do from one and what I wouldn't do from another. Um, and then in my working career, I mentioned her already, Susan Dodd, you know, she, she was an incre- she is an incredible person and did a lot for this college. Yes, still um, does. And still does. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, watching her and seeing what she she has done and continues to do, I, I will never be able to <laughs> be in, you know, fill her shoes, yes. but she's in she's a great role model for for all of us. Susan has been a great ro- role model for me as well. When I came on board 10 years ago, she showed up with a T-shirt the first day, a gavelin <laughs> T-shirt. And she said, uh, you're going to need this here. And yeah. I, I didn't realize at the time how important that was. And Susan's sense of humility mm-hmm. and her ability to sim- symbolically show that you show up and you just serve mm-hmm. um, right. has been something that I've learned from Susan, for sure, for all these years I've been here. Okay, so you're both moms as well. Uh, Nikki, I know I know <laughs> Reagan is very uh, important in your life. And Jillian, you have two? I have two, two boys. Two sons. And how old are they? They're 19 and 16. 17, excuse me. 19 <laughs> and 17. And um, the 19-year-old is actually a student here at Gavilan. Mm-hmm. And um, he'll be starring in Guys and Dolls. He oh, will yes. be? Yes. Oh, He's, he got the great. role of Nathan Detroit. So. Wow, yeah, great. Well, of course, and you were on stage last year. Yes, I was. Yes, you were. (laughs) And so um, talk to me a little bit about the importance that you uh, believe education plays in the life of your kids. Well, I think it's it's critical. Um, And whatever they choose to do with it, I know they'll do great things. I used to be very controlling and helicopter mommy about their education, (laughs) but it didn't work. (laughs) I had to acknowledge these are not the same people as I am, and they are not the same students, but they are very intelligent, and they will be fine. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds to um, me like you have to say that to yourself I do. on a daily basis. <laughs> Sometimes. I mean, they used to do the typical kid things like turn mm-hmm. in their homework but not put their name on it. You know, like, why don't you want the points? <laughs> 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 um, but they're doing great. And we were actually just having a discussion last night because my younger son's not sure, you know, he if he wants to go to college or not. But he wants to manage, like my father-in-law owns properties. He wants to manage mm-hmm. properties and mm-hmm. work with my dad, who is also in the trades too. So we were just talking about that and just, well, you know, you can do that. That's a great pursuit. I We need more people in the trades. Um, but if you want to run your own business, I would highly encourage you to still take classes, mm-hmm. um, business, economics, finance. Um, it, it'll help. So, you know, never underestimate the power of education in whatever form that takes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how about for Reagan? So I I agree with Jillian. I mean, education is critical, and I I would share that. I've been in coach. I was in coaching for a long time, so I felt like I had many, many kids, and that was something that we always talked about was education. Um, But even, you know, now that I have my own flesh and blood, it's it's, (laughs) – it is critical, and, and, you know, whatever she chooses to, to do is, is okay, but the education piece is something that nobody can ever take that away. That's something that she's going to earn. She's going to put in the work to, to achieve that, and the skills that she'll learn getting her education, will, she will take with her wherever she goes, no matter what she gets into, um, whether it's communication skills or, or you know, a- a- any of the skills that you get with your general education or, or um, at higher levels of education, she it, she will need to get an education. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that will not be a question. Um, but again, it's, you know, figuring out what she's passionate about and helping her, um, you know, like I said, she she enjoys math. So how do I continue to encourage that? passion, that excitement that she has now as a little first grader carrying that through middle school and mm-hmm. into high school, um, you know, or her passion for music. I know when I was younger, I enjoyed it too. And then I stopped and then I came back to Gavilan as a student and I took piano um, and mm-hmm. was able to reignite that passion a little bit in one of my general education courses. So it's, you know, it's, it's critical um, to have some form of education and, um, yeah. Something tells me Reagan will have a lot of doors <laughs> open to her and a lot of encouragement from her mom uh, and a lot of coaching along the way, <laughs> yeah. a lot of coaches along the way. Yeah. So here's my final question for the two of you. The theme for International Women's Day this year, which was on March 8th, mm-hmm. is balance for better. And so when you hear that phrase, balance for better, what, what does that phrase mean to you? We're both giggling here. <laughs> I, I probably, I suspect we're dealing with similar issues of trying to find balance between yeah. our work life yes. and our uh-huh. home life and all yep. the things we want to do. Um, so I, I really appreciated that theme this year when I saw yes. that. I was like, oh, that's what I'm working on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's important because it's like the 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 cliche with the airplane with the oxygen mask, but it's a cliche because it's true. Mm -hmm. You have to Mm -hmm. be able to take care of yourself and nourish yourself and, and, um, rejuvenate so that you can give Mm -hmm. to others. If you don't give anything to yourself Mm -hmm. ever, you deplete your, what you're able to give. And so, and I think women have a tendency of taking on more and more and more, because at least I have a hard time saying no. Mm. Um, <laughs> I think that's yeah. kind of common. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it's important for everybody to be able to find that right. that balance. But I think especially for people who have a tendency to say yes to everything. Yeah. I haven't figured out that balance yet, but um, it is something that I'm very aware of. And I do talk to my students about that a lot. As a matter of fact, just before coming over here, I had a student in my office, and we were talking about balancing um, and trying to figure out the balance um, between school and work and mm-hmm. life. And, um, you know, I, I, as parents, we have our children. And, and sometimes, I don't know if you feel this way, Jillian, but for me, sometimes I feel guilty because I'm always working or I'm volunteering and I'm doing all of these things. Um, and then, you know, I have my daughter, too, where I want to spend time with her and do things. Well, now I've started – she's at the age where she can start doing things with me. I'm 
coaching her soccer team and she comes out to, I, I also volunteer at the Garlic Festival. So I bring her with me to meetings and she's my little note taker. So <laughs> that that helps a little bit. Um, but I tell my students a lot, you know, what you were just saying, Jillian, about taking care of yourself. You need to take care of you before you can take care of anybody else or be the best you for anybody mm-hmm. else that needs you. Um, and so that's something that I'm really focusing on this year is um, making sure I exercise and making sure I hydrate and because I know when I do, I feel better and I am better for everybody, not just my daughter, but for, for everybody else around me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we certainly know that statistically women tend to do that balance act uh, to a lesser degree than most others, which is why I think that phrase balance for better mm-hmm. is one that I hope that we here at Gavilan continue to talk about and think about throughout the year. And uh, so I'll be bringing it up. Um, And I think for the two of you, when I see you on campus, I'll be checking in on how you're balancing (laughs) for the better. And, of course, I'll be checking in as I'm asking you to continue to give of yourselves in your leadership positions, which you both do so well and for which I'm so grateful for. So thanks so much for spending some time with me on this great podcast uh, celebrating Women's History Month and celebrating the leadership that you do on campus. Thanks for coming in. Thank Thank you. you. Okay, we're back with the wrap-up for the Presidential Podcast Special Edition Women's History Month. I hope you enjoyed that time with Nikki and Jillian, two great leaders on our campus. You know, there's one question I asked them about inspirational women in their lives, and I've been itching to answer that question myself. So I wanted to take a minute and give a shout-out to inspirational women in my life. I have actually five on my list. Of course, there's there's many more, but in terms of women in my own family, I want to talk about my mom, Beverly Rose, my sister, Nancy Rose Romanola, my Aunt Eleanor Stethers, my daughter, Emily Rose Kyle, and my daughter-in-law, Lauren Neff, because all these women in my life uh, have provided me great inspiration and symbolize what's great about educational service as well. My mom was a kindergarten teacher, and she went back to work when I went to kindergarten. Uh, I was the third child in our family, and she stayed home and helped run the farm with my dad for many years. But she was the epitome of the kindergarten teacher. Her room was an explosion of color and activity, and I loved going into her room uh, after I was done with school. Everything was about learning, Every environment uh, in her room was about learning. And I loved being in her classroom and loved uh, our environment at home, which was all about learning as well. My sister Nancy was a special education teacher for years, primarily with kids on the autism spectrum. And she she is an incredibly inspiring grandmother as I become a grandmother of my four grandkids. She uh, has a room devoted to activities for her grandkids, and I love watching her interact with them now. My Aunt Eleanor, who's 20 years older than me, 82, for years worked in a children's home in her town of Binghamton, New York, and uh, has been very inspiring to kids who wouldn't, who have been through the foster care system. And uh, she continues to provide inspiration in her work there. My daughter, Emily, went on to become a special ed teacher in her educational journey after being inspired by the teachers in our family and her own work with special needs kids along the way. And of course, now she's home uh, on her own parenting journey, raising uh, my twin uh, grandsons. But I think someday Emily will go back to the classroom as well, because it's definitely a calling for her. And my daughter-in-law, Lauren, she's had an amazing background in recreational services throughout her life. But now she has a new calling, working with a uh, group in Folsom, California, that works with moms who have 
who are either pregnant or are recovering after their pregnancy and learning about how to become fit and how to become interactive with their kids in a whole new Fit for Moms program. And she's uh, a rock star when it comes to teaching moms about that. And so I am inspired by these women in my life and uh, appreciate being surrounded by that level of strength, wisdom, and clarity in my work here at the college and in my own life. So I want to wrap up going back to the Inspiring Women book that I uh, told you about from the National Women's Hall of Fame from Seneca Falls, New York. And I picked two more women to read you their bios as we wrap up this special series podcast. So the first is Geraldine Ferraro. Some of you may remember Geraldine Ferraro. She lived from 1935 to 2011. Geraldine Ferraro was the first woman nominated by a major political power as its candidate for vice president of the United States. A teacher and then attorney, Ferraro worked in the Queens, New York District Attorney's Office, where she started the Special Victims Bureau. Ferraro ran successfully for Congress from the New York City's 9th District in 1978. There she was a woman's and a human rights advocate working for passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, sponsoring the Women's Economic Equity Act, ending pension discrimination against women, and seeking greater job training and opportunities for displaced homemakers. In 1984, Ferrero was picked to run as Vice President of the United States on the Democratic Party ticket, with former Vice President Walter Mondale as the candidate for president. In her acceptance speech, she spoke of the realization of the American dream. Tonight, the daughter of an immigrant from Italy has been chosen to run for vice president in the new land my father came to love. The ticket lost, but Ferraro's candidacy forever shaped the American political and social landscape. I remember that time. That was really an important time in our American political system. And the second person I want to write, read to you is Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald lived from 1917 to 1996. Here's a little bit about her. The woman who is perhaps the nation's greatest jazz and pop artist began singing by accident, as legend has it. When Ella, Ella was 15 years old, she appeared as a contestant in a talent competition intending to dance. Her knees shook too much, and so she sang instead, and was heard by a musician in the famed Chick Webb Web Band. Webb brought the young girl along to sing for a one-night stand tryout, and the rest is history. By 1937, only three years after beginning her career, Fitzgerald won her first Downbeat Magazine Award for Most Popular Girl Vocalist, and in 1938, she had her first major hit, A Tisket, A Tasket. Dizzy Gillespie introduced her to the song of Bop, to the world of Bop, and she began her lifelong improvising with Lady Be Good. Of the magic her voice produced, the New York Times drama cl- critic, Brooks Atkinson wrote, she manages things that the human voice can't do. Fitzgerald, with jazz at the Philharmonic producer Norman Granz, began touring worldwide in 1948, and Granz and Fitzgerald demanded equal pay for her with white artists, forcing an important issue that affected many musicians and artists thereafter. Throughout her long career, Fitzgerald recorded the music of the Gershwins, Irving Berlin, Johnny Mercer, Ellington, Armstrong, Harold Arlen, Cole Porter, and more, singing with the world's finest musicians, including Betty, Benny Goodman, Teddy Wilson, and Duke Ellington, to name a few. Fitzgerald is also an inspiration for her lifetime of good works receiving the Whitney Whitney M. Young, Jr. Award of the Los Angeles Urban League, the first woman to receive it, for those who build bridges amongst races and generations. She has received the National Medal of Arts and is the first woman and the first pop singer to receive the Lincoln Center Medallion, previously awarded only to internationally famed classical musicians. 
Her honorary doctorates and Grammys and other awards are almost numberless. And yet, when we think of Ella, we will always, what we will always hear is that pure, passionate, and endlessly creating voice and the soul behind it, telling us what she knows about life and hope and love and courage. Uh, inspirational women, for sure. All right, that wraps it up for this podcast. I'll see you next month with another installment of the Presidential Podcast. You take care. Mm-hmm.